there, there's something that's, that's known as a blood moon, and really a blood moon is just basically a lunar eclipse. That's when uh, the, the earth comes between uh, the sun and the moon is eclipsed you know, during that period of time. And it kind of turns a, a, a reddish hue or kind of an orangish hue, and so it's called the blood moon. And so that's a, a, fairly, a fairly common uh, phenomenon when you have uh, a lunar eclipse. But what happened in 2014 and 15 is you had what's called a lunar tetrad, where you had four of these blood moons in succession that fell on Jewish feast days. On uh, April the 15th of 2014 was the Feast of, of Passover. Then that fall on October the 8th was the Feast of Tabernacles. Then the next spring on April the 4th was another blood moon that fell on uh, the Feast of, uh, of Passover again. And then in the fall on September the 28th, uh, we had another one on the Feast of Tabernacles. So many see that, saw this as a great sign in the heavens because there has been some times in the past when these have happened, when significant events happened for Israel. Whenever people look at the blood moons, one of the things they point out is this is a great cosmic sign, a great cosmic portent. Something is happening and it really deals with the nation of Israel because these blood moons are happening on these feast days. The, the difficulty with that is, is these blood moons that occurred in 2014 and 15, only the last one on September 28th of 2015 is even visible in Israel. Now, some will respond to that and say, well, with 24-7 news today and, and satellites and all the things we have, you know, people can see it on television. But it seems odd to me that the people there in the place that this is supposed to be a portent for, that they don't even see it with their own eyes. It, see, that seems strange to me. Because, you know, they'll go back and point to things like the uh, star appearing to the wise men or things, but th they actually saw it. And so to me, making this, uh, this great sign for the nation of Israel when they could only see one of the four seems odd to me. So when things like this happen, I think it's easy for prophecies like this to gain traction because people kind of have this sense already, a collective sense that something big's about to happen. Uh, but when we look at the, the Bible and what it says when, uh, in the few places in the end times where it mentions the, the moon turning into blood, First of all, it's not even clear in those passages that it's talking about a lunar eclipse. It may be that this is a supernatural event, that God is making the moon turn to blood in that. So it may not be some natural occurrence, but a supernatural event. The other problem is the places it's referred to, like in Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2, which quotes Joel. Um, in uh, Matthew 24, it mentions that the, the sun won't give its light and the moon won't shine. It doesn't mention the moon turning to blood there. And then over in, uh, in Revelation chapter 6, it mentions the moon turning to blood. All of those passages, at least in my understanding in the context, are referring to events during the future time of the seven-year tribulation, either at the middle of it, in the case of, of Revelation chapter 6, or at the end of it, in the case, I think, of, of Joel chapter 2 or in Matthew chapter 24. Because in Matthew 24, it says, after the tribulation of those days, then the sun's not going to shine, the moon won't give its light. And so if we put those passages in their context, it can't be referring to events in 2014 or 15 because we're not even in the tribulation yet. People have always looked up into the heavens and looked for signs there, and God created the heavens with such order and, and the constellations and these various things with such order that you know, people can you know, navigate by this. Uh, now, I can't do that, but people who know how to do it can, can navigate very well by that. And so all of this order that God created, though, and the beauty of it, Satan has come in through false religion and has perverted what God created. And so the order of, of all of that then has led people to take all of that and to worship it, uh, to worship the, 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 uh, the creature rather than the creator, the creation rather than the creator, and come up with all kinds of, of ideas. In fact, all the way back at the Tower of Babel, now, the statement there is, you know, let us build a, a tower that will reach into the heavens. And I don't think they really thought they were going to reach a tower that would go all the way to heaven. But the idea there is, is that they would reach this tower into the heavens. And the word uh, Babel there in, in the Akkadian language had the idea of the gate of God. I think this was to invite the gods to come down and, and to, to be with them and they could commune with the gods. And so 
then when God came down and confounded the language, which it's beautiful there in the passage, it says, and God uh, said, let us go down and, 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 and see what's happening here. And it's like man thinks he's building this massive tower and it's so puny, God has to come down from heaven just to see it. And that confounds the language and people are scattered all over the earth. And they took this false religion with them. And that's why in Revelation chapter 17, it talks about Babylon, the harlot there, the mother it says of all uh, of the uh, abominations uh, of the earth. And so, uh, and all this false religion, all this harlotry. So it was all scattered. And really what we see in all different places of the earth is just kind of a different form really of the same thing. And it all involves the zodiac and constellations and uh, worshiping the heavens. And there's a lot of barbaric uh, things that go along with all of that type of religion. So what God creates, uh, Satan comes along and he, and he counterfeits and he uses to deceive people. Well, Babylon is the second most mentioned city in the Bible. Uh, the book of the, the uh, city of Jerusalem is mentioned about 800 times. Babylon's mentioned almost 300 times. And many have pointed out, and I think it's beautiful, that it's, it's like uh, Jerusalem is, is God's city and Babylon is man's city. Because it's there you have this first rebellion uh, against God under the leadership of one man, of Nimrod. And, and then God comes and scatters people all over the face of the earth. And it, it, it's as if Satan is the master globalist really in some ways. And, and he's been working inexorably since that time to bring the world back uh, to, to one man, uh, the whole world together. And it's fascinating with the globalism that we see today, that's exactly what's happening. The world is shrinking back down to where it's gonna be one world and there'll be one man in the end ruling the world, the Antichrist. And I hold the view that Babylon will be rebuilt. Uh, the city in Iraq will be rebuilt, so man's city will, will, will actually rise again. And that's, uh, there's a lot of reasons that, for that, but, but one of them just simply is, is that the book of Revelation is the unveiling um, it's it's uh, the apocalypse. It's not to hide anything. And it mentions Babylon, the great city, uh, several times there in the book. And so I take that literally. And so I think Babylon, uh, one, one person I read years ago said Babylon is the, uh, was the cradle of civilization and it's the grave of civilization. It's like everything in the Bible comes full circle. You have Genesis 10 and 11 where Babylon is this first city that's, uh, that's built by, uh, by Nimrod after the flood and the Tower of Babel. And then you come to the end uh, of the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, and you have Babylon again. And here's something that's fascinating. If you take Revelation 17 and 18, uh, there are, are 42 verses in those two chapters. And then there's a verse in chapter 16 and a verse in chapter 14 that mention Babylon. That's 44 verses. And if you take chapter 19, verses 1 to 6, which is heaven rejoicing over the destruction of Babylon, that's six more verses. That's 50 verses. And there are only 404 verses in the book of Revelation. So about one-eighth of the book is about Babylon. So that's kind of a good Bible trivia point. You know, what's the most mentioned topic in the book of Revelation? It's Babylon. So whatever it is, it must be very important. And I take Babylon to be this final great city in the world, this rebuilt Babylon. It's this religious economic system that goes along with that, that God is going to ultimately destroy. And then you go to chapter 21 and you have the New Jerusalem. It's God's city. It's kind of like man's city is destroyed and it comes full circle then to God's city. So it's, it is beautiful the way Babylon kind of bookends the Bible and how God, obviously the Bible is inspired, but God is uh, the greatest writer of all, how he kind of brings everything around uh, full circle for us in the end. And it ends with uh, God's city, uh, with uh, that heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, which is uh, the city that we want to live for uh, now in our lives. In Matthew chapter 24, it's talking about all the signs that will come before the Lord Jesus returns to the earth. And it's Jesus gives all this long list of signs. I always think it's interesting when people say we shouldn't be looking for signs, but when Jesus' disciples said, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? He didn't say, well, don't worry about it. He gave this long litany of signs. But it's fascinating there at the end, it says, and they will see the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens. You know, what is that sign? I think it may be something that happens in the heavens that is the final portent, if you will, that Jesus is coming. It's interesting, it, it says in Revelation 1-7 that when Jesus returns at his second coming that every eye will see him. 
And some have wondered, well, if Jesus is coming on one side of the earth, how will people on the other side of the earth see him? Now, Jesus could re reflect that around the earth or whatever, but Dr. John Walvard, who, who taught at Dallas Seminary for many years, the president there, he used to say that it's possible that the second coming of Jesus will last for 24 hours. It will be a long procession as Jesus comes, and you know the armies are gathered there at Armageddon, and there's this long procession, and it could be that the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens is the beginning of that. Just, you know, they look out in the heavens and they see this sign of the Son of Man that he's coming. And then it's this kind of a procession that takes place till he then finally comes and, and arrives on the earth. But I don't think we can be dogmatic about what that particular sign is, but there's something that will be a unique sign that Jesus is returning uh, back to the earth for his second coming. And whatever it is, it must be monumental. It must be a, 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 an unbelievable sign that will capture the attention of the whole earth that Jesus is returning.